pain, pain's a part of life. I think some people believe it's a test of your faith, but if you don't have a faith to believe in, it kind of makes you wonder why, why is there suffering in this world? It was a reason why he took him. Uh, maybe he needed his man was up there to protect protect, to help him in the fight against the devil. A baby is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Why doesn't he want me to have this? Bad things are just the way that you see them. I think God's in everything we do. Why would anybody want to create people who do horrible things to each other? It doesn't make any sense. I don't think God's sitting there and saying these people are hurting and maybe I should help them. I suppose the answers will come. It's just... I'm going through a journey right now that's painful. Well, again, welcome back uh, to week three of Explore God. And I, I, I want to just say at the outset here that I, I have um, so appreciated being a part of a community where we can meaningfully engage questions of this magnitude with with honesty and curiosity and, and grace. Um, and I love the fact, I think it's a, a valuable thing, that across this room we, we come into these questions with a variety of different perspectives and experiences and, and we arrive at different conclusions um, for each one of these. Increasingly we have this tendency to, in, a, in our culture, to, to surround ourselves with people that think like we do, that, that have, a, have come to the same conclusions that, that we have. And I think there's a mistake in that. I think there's actually value in, in engaging in honest conversations with people that, that disagree with you and that see things differently. And so if you're here this morning, maybe you've been here the last couple of weeks, and everything I've said up to this point, you would look at and say, I'm not, I'm not in the same place as he is on this, or I see things completely different. I want you to know that's okay. And that I am glad that you're here this morning, that we're continuing these conversations. Um, it was just a couple years ago that I got a call from a friend um, late one evening, and, and he just said, hey, my wife's in the hospital. And I, I knew almost instantaneously what he was telling me. Um, I, I knew this family well, and I knew that she had struggled with depression for years and years and years. And so um, I, I quickly as I could, I got in the car and, and made my way over to the hospital and I met with the family and, and dealing with everything that was going on. And um, I went into the hospital room and sat down and, um, and his wife, who was, who was waking up, um, looked at me with tears in her eyes. And she said, you know, I've been diagnosed with chronic medication resistant depression. She said, where do I go from here? What, what do I do? What am I supposed to do with that? And I was just quiet. I didn't, I didn't have an answer for that. Chronic medicationally resistant depression. Was essentially, the doctors just said, look, there's really not anything that we can do for you. And her question was legitimate. What, what am I supposed to do with that? And of course, I've been in moments like that where, where the question is asked and you don't have the answer. Matter of fact, one of the, and I'll have to tell this, the, the fuller story, God in that instance has done some amazing things since that moment, has worked in some incredible ways through this lifelong struggle with depression to, to the fact that when I texted her and said, hey, I'm thinking about using your question to me as, as an illustration, she said, please do, because I want, I want my pain and my suffering to bring hope to other people. Because today we're asking that question, and this one I think is, is a doozy. Why does God allow these experiences in our life? Why does he allow there to be pain and suffering in our world? And of all the questions that we're going to ask over these seven weeks together, it's this question that I believe is both the most common and, and for many of us, the most personal of all of these questions. In fact, I, I think it's been my experience that it's this question that oftentimes is, is behind or drives some of the other questions that we find ourselves asking. And I also want to mention at the outset here that if you 
If you find yourself today in a place where you are dealing with honest suffering and pain and struggle, when, when these moments in our life are at the sort of that knife point of suffering, when it's the rawest in us, my experience is that the content that we're going to talk about today isn't necessarily um, what we need to hear in that moment. In fact, when I'm in the hospital with a family, praying with them as they're saying goodbye to somebody that they love, I don't, I don't start going through this material with them. You just, you just sit with them. You mourn with them and you grieve with them and, and you simply be with them. I think oftentimes, as we see in the book of Job, Job's friends in the midst of suffering, they were at their best when they were silent. Sometimes that's true for us as well. I, I can remember a, a particularly difficult season in my own life when, when well-meaning Christians, friends of mine, would come and, and try to encourage me, and they would quote to me Romans 8.28. Have you, have you seen Romans 8.28 before? Have you, maybe I can see some of you even just shaking your heads. You know this. They say, this is Romans 8.28. Here's what Paul says. He says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. The problem is at, the, at that knife point of suffering, maybe it just was my own immaturity at that moment. I wasn't ready to hear that. I, I, it sounded like a Christian greeting card to me. It's sort of like that simple, everything's going to be okay. Now, I 100% affirm everything that Romans 8.28 says. I, I believe it, specifically when you look at it in the context of the rest of what Romans 8 says, what Paul says in, in, in verse 29 as well. But when pain and suffering are fresh, I, we're not necessarily looking for explanation in that moment where we're looking for presence. And so I say all of that because if you are here this morning and this is your reality, if that pain feels so pronounced that it's difficult to almost feel anything else, I'm not going to attempt this morning to offer to you simple explanations to difficult realities. In, in fact, my, my hope and my desire for you this morning is less about hearing what, what I say or discovering the, the meaning behind all the pain and suffering, but really if my prayer and my hope is that you would just discover and experience the fact that there is a community that loves you and that wants to walk with you and that will enter into pain and suffering alongside of you. And, and perhaps... If I can, if we're able just to point you to a God who does not dismiss our suffering with simple platitudes, but he himself enters into our suffering. And he ultimately works to redeem our suffering. This morning, I want to consider three aspects of, of this question of why God allows pain and suffering from the perspective of, of a biblical worldview. I want us to look together at the universal experience of suffering the meaning of suffering, and then finally the redemption of suffering. So let's begin by considering the universal experience of suffering. I think most of you know this, right? But we, we all have a, a variety of different pain tolerances, right? Some, some of you are able to endure pain and keep on going, and others of you, like myself, sort of crumble pretty quickly, right? I've, I've realized, like, when I watch my wife and I deal with difficulty or, like, we, we, you know, it's like if I've got, like, a, a raspy throat and a bit of a cough, I'm like, honey, I'm out, you know, like, I can't help at all, you know? And then she's got, like, 104 fever, and she's, like, folding laundry and, and, and cooking dinner, you know? Um, because she seems to have just this ability that, like, she's just tougher than I am um, all around. And, of course, we, we, we see that also in, as it relates to ideas or experiences of pain and suffering in our life. Some of us are, are able to encounter that. Some of us this morning, I opened my garage and I walked out and I was like, why, Lord? Why would you do this to us, you know? But others, p people continue just to be able to engage life in the midst of circumstances that you look at and you say, how do they get up in the morning? But no matter where we are in that spectrum, pain and suffering is, is not uh, exclusive to a certain group of people. Pain and suffering is a reality that we all encounter at one point in time to one degree or another in our life. 
So the gist of the question, or really I would say the critique of God and the view of suffering typically goes something like this. It says, well, if God is good and if God is all powerful, then why does he allow us to experience suffering? Because either God is, is good, but he can't prevent it, and so therefore he's not all powerful, or God is, is all powerful and he can prevent it, but he chooses not to, and therefore he isn't good. And I want to speak into that question this morning um, just a little bit. And there's a couple observations I want, to, I want us to think about this morning from the perspective of, of how the Bible approaches pain and suffering. First, I want to acknowledge that the, the Bible acknowledges, it even assumes the reality of suffering in our lives. There is a, a false narrative that, that is out there, and I think even at times gets taught that if we believe in God, and if we are obedient enough, if we're following Jesus, we, we should somehow be excluded from the experience of, of genuine or meaningful suffering. But that, that just isn't what scripture teaches. It's not accurate. And in fact, quite the opposite is true. Jesus actively prepares his disciples for experiences of suffering. He, he even goes so far as to tell us to anticipate it. John 16, 33, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, I have told you, that, I've told you these things that in me you may have peace. He says, in this world you will have trouble." But take heart, I have overcome this world. I can't, I can't say that verse without hearing Pastor Roger, for those of you who knew him, um, in my head, because he always used to quote this verse when he would serve communion on Monday Thursday, speaking that truth to the people who just received the elements and knowing all along in his battle with, with cancer that he was saying something that was incredibly pertinent and real to himself. See, in this one verse, Jesus speaks to the, both the universal experience of suffering, but he also prepares us for, the, for that experience, and he points us then ultimately to the hope of the redemption of that suffering, and we'll come back to that. The book of 1 Peter, the entire book is written to, to a people in the midst of, of horrible suffering, and yet if you look at what what Peter writes to them, he offers both perspective in the midst of their suffering, but he seeks to prepare them for more suffering that is to come. He, he seems to be telling them that this isn't the end of it. If you look at what Paul writes to Timothy, this is 2 Timothy 3, 12. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's, that's, that's a hard truth. The book of Lamentations in the Old Testament. It's written by the prophet Jeremiah following the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And the entire book is a series of just grief-stricken prayer. If you take the, the book of Psalms, the largest book in the Bible, 150 Psalms, over 60% of those Psalms are what we call like Psalms of lament. They're Psalms of grief and sorrow. Just a couple examples. I don't have these on the, on the screen this morning, but this is Psalm 6.6. 6. It says, I am worn out from all my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Like there's times when I've read the Psalms and I'm like, David is melodramatic, right? Like that seems, but then you look at what he's experienced and you read what's going on in his life. It's just the honest cry of the heart. Psalm 13, 1 through 2, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Psalm 42, 3, my tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Psalm 88, 6, God has put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. You get the picture. The, 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 the Bible is incredibly honest about the reality of suffering. It, it doesn't seek to dismiss it. It doesn't pretend it doesn't exist. And it doesn't give super, uh, superficial answers into the midst of it. It assumes it. And it speaks into it. 
And so as true as this is, as honest as the Bible is about the reality of suffering in our life, it also, we also discover in the midst of the story the source of our suffering. We discover the source of our suffering. Because as, as honest as it is about the reality, we're still left with the question of why. Why is this our experience? Why, why does it, it, it function this way? If we think about the overarching narrative of, of Scripture, we are introduced very early on in Genesis 3 to the story of the fall. We, we have previous to this, we have humankind living in perfect community with, with each other. We have humankind living in perfect community with their God, and then there's rebellion. And there's pride, there's distrust, there's, there's this belief that God is, is holding something back from them. That, that he is not, in fact, good. And sin enters the picture. Community is broken. And the result is suffering. In fact, if you turn to Genesis 3. Following the, the introduction of sin into the narrative. God now speaks to Adam and Eve, and, and we begin to see just the consequence, the ramifications of, of all of this on humanity, on each of us. And he's already spoken now to the serpent, to Satan, and he said, he's, he's helped, he's informed him about the ramifications for him, what's coming, which is good news, so the, the gospel there, his, his head's getting crushed. But then he now speaks to Adam and Eve. This is verse 16. He says, To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. So at the very outset uh, of this explanation, the, we see pain introduced to, to the experience. And it goes on to say, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And there's all this relational conflict that now enters into the picture. And then he goes on and he says to Adam, because you listened to your wife, and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. So the, the ramifications of this aren't just relational, and it's not just personal experiences of pain, but it affects creation itself. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat of the plants of, uh, of the field. And by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until... You return to the grounds from since, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. And now there's, there's death that enters into the scene. See, in, in the biblical worldview, as we see here in Genesis, pain and suffering finds its source, its root source in the fall. In this moment, it's a, a consequence, a ramification of sin entering into the story. And from that moment forward, the experience for humanity is one of pain and sorrow. It's one of suffering and death. And no one escapes it. It's true for every single one of us. So we experience this reality on, on a number of fronts in our life. On the one hand, we, 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 have, we know or experience what we call self-caused suffering. This is when we suffer as a result of, of choices that I make, things that I do in my life that have ramifications for it. It's the result of my own choice. When I was in high school, I, uh, my best friend and I, he went with me on my youth group's winter retreat, which was a, a ski retreat. And so we went up to uh, the ski slopes that day, and, and you're coming up to the lifts. If you've skied before, you get, there's a variety of different lines, and you, get, you don't always match up with each other perfectly. And so we, this was a two-person lift, and we were coming up to it, and he got in, in front of me, and so somebody was coming in from the next line, and it happened to be um, another teenager, girl, who was pretty attractive. Um, and so my friend Vince gets on the lift and she pulls up next to him and he's excited about the next five minutes that he gets to sit next to this pretty girl, right? And just as the ski lift is coming up, he, he kind of wants to celebrate the moment with me. So he turns back to kind of give me like, are you seeing what's going on here kind of thing, like two thumbs up. And right then the chair of the lift comes swinging around. 
and it grabs Vince, my friend, by his, his snow pants. And he gets kind of like flipped over forward. She safely seated. He's kind of like <laughs> hanging by his snow pants as the lift begins to go up. <laughs> and he gets about four or five feet in the air before the, the, uh, the lift director, instructor, can, can hit the button to stop it. And as he stops it, it jerks and it lets go and he falls flat on his face into the snow. And he just sort of turns over with snow in his face and he looks at me and he goes, I deserved that. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know that feeling, right? We, we know situations of our own making. In fact, when we talk about this, this is the sort of experience of suffering that we feel almost most resolved in because we understand the source of it. Because it was a situation of our, our own making, it's me. It, was, it, was, it resided in me, I'm experiencing the consequences of my own stupid decisions. But there's also other caused suffering. Of course, this is the suffering that we experience at, at the result of brokenness in other people. This, is, this can range in impact from being insensitive or selfish all the way up to neglect or abuse, to violence, to, to murder, to every sort of ugliness that we see playing in the world around us. And here's the thing about this other cause suffering. To one degree or another, every single one of us will experience this from someone else. And every single one of us will inflict it on somebody else, to one degree or another, because it's a part of our human condition. That's why when we talk about the church being a, a safe place, wanting it to, our desire is that, that this is a place of healing. I want to take a moment here just to tell you about our care department. Because if we're honest about life, if we're honest with ourselves, if we're saying that this is a universal experience, then this needs to be a place where we can bring pain and suffering, whether or not we are the cause of it or we are the victims of it. And that's what our care department's for. It's, it's support groups that help us either deal with issues and struggles in our own lives or recover and seek healing from things we experienced. It's, it's the opportunity to seek counseling and referrals and to, to put you with people that can help navigate this for, for that season of life. And in my experience, it's something that every single one of us requires at some point in time or another. My hope and prayer is that for each of us, this place would be a place of healing. Again, this, this type of suffering, this suffering that we experience at the hands of others, this is something that for most of us, even as unjust as it may seem, we rationally typically comprehend it because we can identify the cause. We can look and see the actor who's responsible for the suffering. We, we have someone to blame. But there's that third kind of suffering, that, that undeserved, unexplained experience of suffering. This is, this is when there's an earthquake in the Indian Ocean and it sets off a tsunami that kills nearly a quarter of a million people. It's a country like Haiti who is already depleted and, and desperate and when an earthquake hits that, 160,000 are dead and in nearly the entire country is left in even a greater state of desperation and ruin. On a more personal level, this is those moments when a child receives a, a, a diagnosis that we can't wrap our heads around. Moments when innocence is shattered and suffering ensues and we're looking for someone. Someone that we can blame, someone that we can hold it to. I quoted earlier from Romans chapter 8. I want to I go back there for a moment because Paul, Paul speaks into this in, in Romans 8. In fact, a lot of this chapter is dealing with the reality of suffering. But Paul writes in verse 20, he says, For the creation was subject, subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. And brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. In verse 22, he says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. 
So Paul, when he's talking about the reality of suffering, he's talking about what took place in Genesis 3, he's essentially saying it's all broken. All of creation experienced broken. And it's not just you and I relating to each other. It's not just things that, that are the result of my own decisions. He's saying the universal experience that we have as a result of sin is brokenness. And that manifests itself in, in pain and suffering. But the Bible doesn't leave us there. It's not the end of the story. I want to take a few moments then to look at at the meaning of suffering. The meaning of suffering. Back in Romans 8, just a couple verses prior to this, Paul continues to write. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. So Paul now makes this, he, he, he makes a value statement in the midst of the experience of suffering. Not not suffering that he's talking about for somebody else, but, but his own experience of suffering. And he says, it's not worth comparing to this future glory, this glory that is to come. When I was, uh, several years ago, um, I was putting my little one to bed because she was sick, dealing with just like a stomach virus or something like that. And and was just kind of wrestling with why she was sick. So I was in best sort of parenting way, trying to explain to her viruses and how these things get passed around. I could sort of tell she wasn't really asking that question. She wasn't asking like the physical questions of where sickness comes from. She was asking the larger question of like, why do people get sick? So in best I could in a childlike way, I tried to explain the impact of sin and what that does. And she just sort of like rolled her eyes with this pale little face and groaned and said, why did Adam and Eve have to eat that fruit, you know? <laughs> and I remember that story because in this, this childlike way, Naomi was asking this, this larger question that we all ask. And that is simply, if suffering is created by the problem of sin at the very beginning, then why did God create a world in which the possibility of suffering could exist? Why, why not create a design where that's not even an end result that, that's open? Every religion, every worldview has to have an answer for the issue of suffering. Everyone has to explain it somehow. In Eastern philosophies, it's, it's a balance of, of the universe. It's the yin and the yang and the good and evil. In the Buddhist worldviews, they believe suffering is the result of selfish cravings and personal desires. So if I, can, if I can suppress selfish craving in me, if I can suppress the idea of what I personally desire, then I can alleviate pain and suffering. In the Hindu worldview, it's all about karma. That we're all sort of getting what we deserve to one degree or another, whether it's good or bad. And by the way, we adapt um, variations of this pretty prolifically in in our own Western culture. For the materialist or the naturalist or, or even the deist in some ways, it's a combination of fatalism and cynicism and, and moralism. So if, if we can just fix the problem, if we can fix the broken system, if we elect the right politicians and, and we improve the education system, if we can integrate the right form of economics into the world, then we can alleviate or at the very least reduce suffering. But every generation is left solving the problems of the ones who came before them. There's just a couple things I, I want to highlight here from the perspective of a biblical worldview. First is that suffering is possible because we were created for relationship. Suffering is possible because we were created for relationship. This goes back to week one when we asked ourselves, what is our design purpose? What has God made us for? And we answered that by saying we were created by a loving God to be loved by him and to know him and to love him in response. This is, this is what we were made for. But it is also that exact purpose that leaves open the experience of, of suffering. St. Augustine of, of Hippo, when he talks about the, the reality of suffering in the world, calls it the the privatization of good, it exists as a necessary possibility in a world of free and morally conscious 
creatures. In other words, what, what Augustine is saying here is, is to create a world without the possibility of pain means to create a world without the possibility of love. But God is love. And his purpose was to love us and for us to love him. If you take that and you apply it to my relationship with my wife, in order for that to be a loving relationship, in order for me to experience a loving relationship with her, I have to risk the possibility that she could choose not to love me. If I created an environment where her only option was to respond to me in, in loving ways, I don't have a marriage partner, I have a prisoner, right? I've held her captive. Love requires the possibility that that we may not love each other. See, we were made in his image, not as robots, but we were made for relationship because he loves us and he's given us the ability to love him or to not love him. Additionally, then, suffering in the Christian worldview is not the final word. See, if we go back to that original question that we asked, if God is, is good and God is all powerful, then why do we suffer? But the problem with that question is that's not all that God is. He, he is not just good, and he's not just all-powerful, and it, at the very least, he is also eternal. I think that this is really important as it relates to understanding what Paul wants to get across in Romans chapter 8, that from a Christian worldview, suffering is not cyclical, it's not the balance of the universe, the yin and the yang, but it's linear. It has a defined start in Genesis 3, and it has a defined finish in, in the future glory that Paul talks about in Romans 8. And furthermore, when we see it in light of this future promise, then God is able to take our experiences of evil and suffering. And as Paul says, and this is where this starts to, to make sense for me, He's Paul, when we, when we see it in that lens, then Paul's saying he is able to work for the good of those who love him. Which also leads us to then this third reality, which is the, the redemption of suffering. The redemption of suffering. And this for me is what personally, what I find most compelling about the biblical worldview of pain and suffering. Is that God chose not to, to keep a safe distance that he would choose not to just sort of wipe his hands of it and say, you know what, this is a situation of your own making. God became one of us. He entered into our suffering in order to suffer himself on our behalf. You've heard me say many times before, I've talked about the story shortly after starting at Chapel Street, literally the week of it. Um, 12 years ago, my dad received the news that he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he fought a valiant fight and, and gave it all he could, but um, eventually he lost that battle. And I've, I've talked about the, the ramifications on that in me because I was incredibly close to him and I loved him and he was this huge influence in my life and, and I felt like this sense of, of lostness in his absence. And I remember just wrestling with God in the midst of this situation trying to understand how this experience in my life was going to ultimately affect my relationship with him and, and just trying to process all of this. And I remember that in one point in time, just through tears, coming to the realization, seeing for the first time that I was wrestling with somebody who knew what it was to suffer. I wasn't wrestling with somebody who was, who was thinking of this philosophically or, or was thinking of this from, from a, a place of, or a lack of experience, but I was talking to somebody and wrestling with somebody that knew what it was to suffer. And if you have ever suffered at like a, a heart-wrenching level, like the loss of someone you love or an experience of just genuine pain, you know when you're talking to somebody who's been there. Like you know when somebody is talking back to you that they've, that's, a, that's a journey that they've taken. And this is who we have in Jesus. If you flip over real quickly to Philippians, this is one of my favorite passages in, in all of Scripture. And again, this is Paul. And in verse 5, he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
In verse 6, he follows it up now. He says, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, it says he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, what Paul offers us between this passage in Philippians and what we see in Romans is that we discover that it is God in the person of Jesus Christ who will ultimately be the resolution of our suffering, and that happens through his suffering. Peter Kraft, in his book, Making Sense of Suffering, says this. He says, God did not give us a placebo or a pill or good advice. He gave us himself. He came. He entered space and time and suffering. See, if the, in that overarching narrative of Scripture, if the first two acts of the story are creation and the fall, then the rest of the story, the final two acts, are about redemption and restoration. God is actively moving. He's actively working. He's using his followers in his work of repairing a broken world. The book of Revelation gives us this perspective on a future reality when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth. And he says this in in chapter 21, he says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. See, the the greatest redemption of suffering is the cross. The cross is the greatest evil enacted on the greatest innocence and by which God accomplishes the greatest good. Our redemption, our salvation, our our restoration. So the promise of God is not that we won't suffer. We will. Scripture is very straightforward on this point. But the promise of God is that he has come to redeem our suffering and he one day will come again to end our suffering and he does all of it because he came to suffer on our behalf. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for this time this morning. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity together to look at a difficult topic that for many of us today is not just something that we're talking about theoretically, but it's, it's a reality. So God, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would continue to bring comfort and peace into the midst of a world that is anything but that. And Lord, we look forward. We look forward to the day when all pain and suffering will come to an end and there will be a new heaven and a new earth because you came and you suffered on our behalf. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.